game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. everyone, this is Raghu Marcus with another edition of Ramdas Here and Now. And this is a, a very big moment in time for us. And uh, it has to do with what many of you have already heard over the last few weeks about our new Ramdas uh, film called Becoming Nobody. Well, it's going to finally see the light of day. And it's been a four-year labor of love. Uh, many people involved, of course, particularly Jamie Cato, who is the director and co-producer with me on the film. And uh, so you could say, well, four years, that's a long time. And uh, when you see the picture, it's very, very much a wonderful representation of, of the arc of Ramdas's life and teachings. And I'm going to get into it. Uh, I'm going to play some of the... So what we did is we took excerpts from many uh, talks from Ramdas and uh, and wove a blanket, we feel, which is really uh, quite a wonderful piece. And uh, there's great, great... Uh, archival footage of Ramdas and pictures and uh, wonderful uh, f- uh, film B-roll uh, that uh, connects with what Ramdas is talking about that makes it a lot of fun. There's a fantastic interview that is a thread that runs throughout the picture that Jamie did with Ramdas several years ago. And uh, it's, it's pretty delightful. So I'm really happy that this is seeing the light of day. And what you can do to get an idea of it all is go to becomingnobody.com. And there is a place. So the, the film will be out uh, across the, uh, certainly on the West and East Coast, and then filling in uh, to a select amount of theaters. It's going to be, you know, 30, 40 theaters uh, through this fall across the country. But at becomingnobody.com, you can just, uh, you'll be able to navigate towards where all the theaters are, the show times, the dates, and everything. You can even connect there to buy tickets in advance, which would be a great thing. Of course, the with the theaters, the more people that are showing up uh, in, especially in the first few days, uh, then, of course, they'll, they'll keep it on for a longer time. So, um, yeah, becomingnobody.com. Do go there. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is play the trailer that we created, of course, the audio of the trailer, which gives a real idea of the thread that was created uh, in this film. A little unbeknownst to us after we had come up with the title becoming nobody it was only then that we started looking at uh, actually what happened is at one point months ago many months ago as this was all being finished and so on um i was doing a podcast with ramdas uh, meaning i was taking uh, excerpts of uh, previous talks that he v- had given and stuff that interested me that I wanted to share. And there was this one line just after we had uh, given the title Becoming Nobody you know, for the film, and there was this beautiful one line that Ram Dass came up that said, came up with that said, only nobody gets free. It flipped me out. I couldn't believe that that he had addressed this you know, I'm, I'm talking, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, something like that. Um, in that way, 
So we actually made a little T-shirt of it. I, it was pretty good. Uh, only nobody gets free. Another, somebody said to me the other day, how about only nobody gets out of here alive? I, I like that even better. Anyhow, so when you, you'll hear this, uh, the trailer, uh, the audio, and uh, it's all around Ram Dass's concept of how we all go through somebody training, right? From birth through childhood. In, in our formative years, all of these habitual patterns and neurotic t- tendencies are created to create this wonderful somebody that we then spend a lifetime um, evacuating that concept of ourselves, that story we tell ourselves. Uh, and, and those of you that listen to my uh, other podcast, Mind Rolling, know that I have been spending a lot of time around uh, the way that we glue ourselves to our thoughts, the way that we really believe our stories and how it really uh, is uh, problematic to have any kind of spacious um, connection with our lives on a day-to-day basis where we are not just uh, thrown about by our thoughts and by the circumstances uh, that come to us. So this, uh, so here's the, uh, just a short uh, trailer that gives you a real idea of, of uh, the gist of, of the movie. Uh, here it is. When I was born, I donned a space suit for living on this plane. And everybody comes up and says, what a nice suit. And you're constantly looking into other people's eyes to find out if you're really wearing a nice space suit. It's what I call somebody training. I have been huffing and puffing and trying to get enlightened as hard as I could. I have fasted, prayed, mantraed, pilgrimaged, sat before my guru, done all night this isn't that, meditated. I mean, I've really put my time in, so to speak. In the 60s, Timothy Leary gave me psilocybin and it changed my life. I tried every chemical possibility to try to stabilize that state through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of explorations. I still came down and I kept coming down and coming down. And then I went to India and I met Maharaji, my guru, and I met a being who didn't come down. My Maharaji in my head is more like a psychiatric nurse. (laughs) (laughs) Each of us must be true to ourselves to hear what is our unique way through. Because if you get phony holy, it ends up kicking you in the butt. You've got to stay true to yourself. Years back when I started to do this meditation, I could go off and I could have a six-hour fantasy, a six-hour sexual fantasy, sitting in Burma all by myself in a cell. And I'd look like I was meditating all the time, and they, nobody knew, you know. And I, Oh, God. <laughs> I think that the spiritual trip at this moment is not necessarily a cave in the Himalayas, but it's in relation to the technology that's existing. It's relation to where we're at. I think that's all part of one package now. We've got to control the mind. We've got to transcend the mind. We've got to unclutter the mind. All kinds of the mind. Well, maybe. (laughs) I think you'll find my theory a little bit more advanced, Ram Dass, if you just listen. And you walk down the street and you're somebody. So you know who you are. You dress like somebody. Your face looks like somebody. Everything is somebody. We enter in these conspiracies. I'll make believe you are who you think you are. If you make believe I am who I think I am. You can see them in everybody. I mean, everybody's busy being somebody. So there you go. That's the trailer for Becoming Nobody. And uh, as I said, it really uh, opens up uh, the door to the essence of what this movie is and what, uh, how we're portraying Ram Dass's life and teachings in a very specific way around the concept of becoming a somebody and then eventually becoming a nobody. Maybe we should talk about what the Becoming Nobody uh, means because there's a couple of different levels of it. There's the level of 
the nobody that we met, Ram Das and myself, Krishnadas and uh, and others, uh, other Westerners, the nobody we met in India, which is Neem Karoli Baba, and and what we mean by that is encountering a being that was not in the normal relational uh, aspect of, of when you meet another person, you know there's a give and take. Uh, there, you know, of course, we all have these trepidations, especially when we meet somebody we don't know, and um, there's a lack of, uh, shall we say, unconditionality around that relationship because there's something we want or there's something they want or there's some judgment going on back and forth, all of the kinds of things that make up a relational space between you and another person. That was not happening with Neem Karoli Baba, with Maharaji. We instantly knew here was somebody who was not living in any kind of subject object. You just knew it in your deepest part of yourself. And there was no conditionality. And of course, you've heard Ramdas over and over talk about how uh, when he met M- Maharaji, he knew that it was just uh, complete no judgment. And uh, so it was really um, a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, way in which he describes that particular condition of being nobody, empty of any kind of of self, little self, not the big self. So um, that's one level of becoming nobody, and very, very few beings in, in, on this planet have achieved that kind of, uh, of cutting through of subject-object, of, of polarization of, in any sense of the word. And it's just here because... He is giving to everybody that comes anywhere near him in his, in his field. There is nothing but that. Uh, uh, doing what's necessary to help people get free. And that's about it. So that's one level. That's the highest level. Then another level is, uh, is just someone like Ramdas, who has been working on himself. And my best example is when I first met him and he put himself aside to be completely there and present, fully, fully being here now with me in that moment. And he has done that throughout his life with everyone that he meets. Uh, now, sometime, you know, in some cases, of course, depending on where he was at and, and how much of that me, me got put aside, uh, he would be more there than, uh, than not, or less there than not. Uh, and, uh, of course, after his stroke and where he is now, he is more uh, there, what he was talking about and what he was pointing to, um, he has actualized within himself in a major way. As uh, any of you who have, uh, you know, heard him recently or seen the live streams from the retreats or actually gone to, to one of the retreats. So, um, so the, um, the other thing that I wanted to bring along here is, you know, some, some of the talks that the excerpts in the movie come from. And in fact, we put together, uh, along with our partner Sounds True, uh, a companion to the movie which has the full talks from which these excerpts were taken. And that is going to be available around September 6th when the movie comes out. You'll be able to find it through ramdas.org, the shop, or, or whatever, uh, or through Sounds True. It's called Essential Ramdas. It's called Becoming Nobody, the Essential Ramdas Talks. Um, so this one particular one that I wanted to just uh, point out is, is around form and suffering. And uh, he starts out with this thing. The, uh, he talks about the picture, the, the, the concept and the picture of the Buddha with the smile of unbearable compassion. And, uh, and around suffering, we, we react immediately because We've got to change the, that's in us, it's our human quality, change the circumstances around suffering. We've got to immediately change it because it threatens the, the stability of our egos. It's our defense mechanisms. mechanisms. Um, so, um, 
some of the ways in which those mechanisms mechanisms work that Ramdas talks about are the spiritual up level, right? That's a biggie. It's also called spiritual bypass, the way in which we attempt to push away the pain. And cynicism is another, and that's something in my own little world I have dealt with and am dealing with uh, and have dealt with for a long time uh, because uh, it seems to be one of my big defense mechanism is, is using cynicism in a way that uh, allows me to be able to back off from any anything that's untoward, back off also of of uh, you know choosing preferences. Cynicism is really can be really a uh, um, shall we say a dangerous uh, attitude uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, especially in dealing with suffering and uh, so. What what needs to happen, as he talks about, is that there needs to be a um, a break between the perception to the suffering and the reaction to the suffering. This is probably one of the most important points he makes in this particular talk, and and the way to do that is through mindfulness to be with the suffering, not push it away, and um, and and another thing along with cynicism is righteousness, right? Uh, righteousness. Uh, doesn't allow us to hear the entire um, landscape of of what is uh, happening through the circumstances and and finally the suffering that comes to us um, when we're really righteous, meaning we think we absolutely know what the truth is. It doesn't allow for much spaciousness, and and he talks about how this, particularly with social action, this is a you know, certainly a huge problem. So here's the, uh, I just want to play this. Um, this is from the talk Form and Suffering. There was a, 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 a statue of the Buddha that has a, a, the mouth has a little turned up smile at the corner of the lips. And it's called the Buddha with the smile of unbearable compassion. The smile of unbearable compassion. Sounds like a contradiction in terms. What does he know that we could reflect about? Because most of us, when we come to suffering, when we face suffering, if we can, the first thing is we have to react immediately because we have to change it. That's the first natural, spontaneous reaction and fed by our psychological ego because the recognition of suffering is a threat to the stability of the ego so that when you look at it, you want to either push it away, which is all of the defense mechanisms, all of the denial, which you rationalize it, like you can push it away by going up in levels of consciousness. You can go up to the plane where you're looking out and you see it all as karma. And you, somebody falls down in front of you and you say, karma. And you say of that child, karma. And that's really pushing it away. You can feel it. You can feel the coldness of it. And you can feel how how cut off a person who would say that must be. When they use the spiritual label in order to push away the pain of the situation. And another one we all use is pity, which is a way of pushing people away too. Oh, isn't that terrible? Which is a, it's a certain distance that you put between you and the suffering. Another person, pity. Sort of, I'm glad it's not me. And of course, denial and so on. And one of the things is, since it is the heart that reacts so first, initially, and the human heart's what's having the commerce with the suffering, 
the general thing is the heart just closes. You just freeze. You just go dead. You go cold. You go icy. You don't know what to do because you feel impotent to do anything in the face of immense suffering. And you develop not only spiritual up-level intellectual defenses, but you develop just other intellectual defenses like cynicism, which is a way of getting into your intellect and pushing and putting distance between you and that which is threatening to you. The other strategy for people that experience the suffering is move towards it to change it. I got to do something about it. And a lot of you are feeling, I got to do something about things because there's so much pain and suffering. But since no matter what you do, there's going to be more, you can never do enough. You will never have the satisfaction of having eliminated suffering which we'll see why in a moment. So that as long as you are at all attached to getting rid of the suffering before you can stop doing, you will just do and do and do and do. And if you don't watch out, your identification with being the doer will finally burn you out. You just get exhausted from trying so hard. And you will get frustrated and frustration leads to aggression. So you'll end up being angry at yourself and at the whole system. And you get depressed. And so what are you contributing then? Now, if you can hear the edge of it, any reaction you have to the suffering in which you're identified with the reactivity is reinforcing the plane of reality in which suffering is real. Let me come at that much slower. I just wanted to say it out front before I forget it. Now, the, uh, the Buddha, the Tama Buddha, said that at night in the early watches of the night, the Buddha would look out over the entire Buddha fields and see all the suffering. And then he'd see who was ready, whose veil was very thin, who was ready to awaken out of the illusion that creates the suffering. And anybody that has done sadhana of any kind, spiritual practice, realizes that what ultimately has to be done is that you have got to break in between the perception of the suffering and the reaction to the suffering and bring into, into it some mindfulness. So that the first thing you do is start to break in there by just sitting with the suffering. Not do anything about it, just sit with it first until you can be with suffering. Until you don't have to push it away so hard. You know, I've had many uh, LSD trips and other psychedelic chemicals in which I've sat with suffering, not just my own, which in which my whole, all my musculature and all, everything is aching and racked with pain. My jaws gritted, all of that. But just looking with like eyes, those kind of hollow eyes feeling that you see in people in uh, prison of war camps or things like that. That look of just looking at what is and looking at suffering and suffering and just visions of suffering going before your eyes. And I think of people that didn't ask for this, getting this in an LSD trip, and it's what's called a bad trip. 
from my point of view, it is opening to what is. And it's, that's part of what meditation is about, is opening to what is. Not pushing and pulling, just being with it. And one of the big leaps is when you are ready to stop reacting so fast in order to be with it to hear the whole nature of things, to hear how it all is about suffering. And what is required is that because your heart is closing down as the reaction, as you sit with it for a while and you just start to be able to look at it, your heart starts to open in the presence of it. And you have your heart open in hell is really what is being required of you. I have, um, with Stephen Levine and others, have um, had dying retreats. And in these retreats, very often for the first few days, it's very cathartic. It's just bringing out all the kind of emotional, the, the pain and fear people have about death. And then very often we show films, or we've been showing films. We'll show a film like uh, Red Asphalt, which is a film put out by the California State Highway Patrol to show to drunk drivers about what happens on the highway. And it's heads sticking through windows and decapitated and smashed bodies. And it's really, it's police photography. It's not cleaning up the act. And people look at it and they immediately react. It's, you know, turn away, steal themselves. And we look at it. And then we start a meditation, bringing the awareness to the breath, just be with what is. Hear the rain outside, see the lights, see my body up here. Just be with what is. And then we've got somebody being with what is quietly. We run the film again, silently, with a meditative soundtrack. Just be with what is. Because part of the secret of compassion is being able to embrace darkness into light. It's being able to embrace suffering into yourself. It's being able to acknowledge and allow. And then the impeccable warrior hears what to do about it. But the first step is slowing down. And when you're too righteous, you can't even slow down. How can I even Consider allowing this. I've got to do something about it. Can you hear that little place in there? It's a very interesting one. It's really the one that the social action groups are having to deal with right now in terms of their own growth. So that was form and suffering. And uh, the next talk I want to uh, highlight is from uh, Just Another Cloud. I love this. And in the movie... There is a whole sequence around um, the concept of a cloud in a frame. Just think of a, he talks about a, paint, a painting of a, of a gray cloud. And within that frame, there's nothing else to, that you can see. Except if you extended the frame a little bit, if you created a larger frame, you would see some blue sky. And then suddenly you realize, okay, wait, it's not all gray cloud. It's not all grief, self-pity. It's not all about the models and stories that we tell ourselves. The blue sky is the beginning of spaciousness to see all of the negative stuff that we get into on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis with much more clarity. And once that blue sky is... Uh, nurtured and cultivated through practice, which meditation, mindfulness, chanting, reading spiritual texts, whatever it is, that blue space gets bigger 
and bigger and and suddenly the the negative stuff stops gluing itself i like that word gluing itself to to us in a way that is overwhelming that overwhelm stops so um yeah, he talked. I love his little mantra at the end of this. Ah, so he used to do that. I remember that. And that too, you know, it's okay to be with it. Ah, so it's lovely. Um, okay, so here's just another cloud, an excerpt from that talk. If you can imagine having a lover who unconditionally loves you just the way you are. You got gas, fine. You got no teeth, fine. Black, white, yellow, brown, fine. Old, young, battered, beautiful, fine. Angry, happy, depressed, fine. God's always here. Well, if your lover is always here and always got arms open and always wide open and receiving, what's stopping the process? Why aren't you home free? Well, apparently you're not home free because you're a conditional lover. While God's an unconditional lover. And you're saying to God, look, I can really only be with you if you will make it the way I want it. (laughs) Got through to one of us. It's so horrible, it really is, yes. God, if I were only 20 again, I'll love you. (laughs) See, once you get into this particular love affair, and you see that the only thing that keeps you from beloved is your own head trips of who you think you are, and who you think you aren't, and how you think it is. A lot of stuff that meant a lot to you before stops meaning so much. I mean, I don't really care if I'm bald as a billiard ball. (laughs) Because God loves me. I used to be so ashamed of all my sexual weirdities. Boy, did I go out of my way to practice duplicity. And you know, now I couldn't care less. It is what it is. And when I look at you, since I'm just looking for God, all I see is God in drag. And you look at me and you say, you weirdo. I say, oh, no, God, you won't get me with that. (laughs) I see through that one, too. Because I'm not buying it. Because I am what I am, and you are what you are. What we're talking about here are very subtly varying techniques for working with where you're stuck. One of them is taking the stuckness and using it to see the way in which you are clinging. You just understand that once you feel any suffering at all, it's because you're clinging. And you know that in your head. Suffering, ah, clinging. No clinging, no suffering. So that you get so, the minute you start to suffer, you look to see where you're clinging. And you understand that you're trying to cling, as Stephen pointed out, to stuff that is in form and all form changes and passes away. And Christ makes it very clear, lay not up your treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt. And Buddha says all clinging is suffering. And there we have it. Everybody agrees.
So one of those strategies is where the stuff is so real, you work with the reality of it and you say, yes, I'm suffering. And you start to open around the suffering, create a little space around the suffering to see it for what it is, suffering, clinging, ah, uh, so. If you can imagine a picture frame in which there is a, a painting of a gray cloud, but the painter made the cloud bigger than the frame that he had, or she had. So what they did was they cut a little off the edge and they just put it in the frame. And so all there is is gray cloudness because there's no edge anymore to the clouds. So all you have is gray in a frame. And you look at it and you say, what's that? But if you used either a little bigger frame or painted a little smaller cloud, you'd see that there's a little blue sky around the edge of the cloud. And you say, oh, a cloud. What do you know? All the time, I thought the universe was gray. <laughs> The cloud is the grief, the cloud is the self-pity, the cloud of the models, and that little blue sky becomes the space. And the meditative techniques are designed to give you that space. And the minute there's that spaciousness, ah, it's just another cloud. You know what clouds do in the sky? They come and they go. Every time I used to get high, I'd come down. Sort of the way of, way of life. You go up, you come down. And the first time I'd come down, I'd think, I've lost it, I've fallen out of grace, I've blown it for this lifetime. And then the next weekend, I'd get high again. And the first hundred times, each time you come down, you think you've blown it again. You've lost it, you're never going to have it ever again. And then you arrive at a place when you stop clinging to your highs, you stop clinging to your lows. Ah, wow, what ecstasy. I can look into the face of God. Wow, dig this depression. Ooh, I have never seen a depression as bad as this. <laughs> I don't think anybody could ever get out of this depression. There is a brand of cigarettes put out in India that many of us carried with us, just the box of them. The brand is called Passing Show. It's all just passing show. Highs, lows, depressions. How real do you want it to be? One strategy is you work with it. Working with it is investing it with reality. The other strategy is you put your reality somewhere else and the whole business starts to turn into nothingness. You start to put your reality on your breath. You put your reality in your devotion to God. You put your reality in any of your yogic techniques. And all this other stuff starts to fall into perspective. See, the working with the grief has the pitfall that is, which is a tantric technique, working with the grief to get beyond the grief, we're going into it, has the pitfall that it's like a bottomless well and you may never get out of it because you keep feeding on it and feeding on it and feeding on it. I mean, if you thought you cried yesterday, nothing like if we go deeper how you could cry tomorrow. That's the pitfall of that strategy. The pitfall of the other strategy, of, of course I got grief, oh God. Of course, I've got grief, breathing in, breathing out, is that you will push the stuff under prematurely and it will sit inside you like a festering sore, oozing horrible gases that will color everything in your life always. Want a more ugly description of it or is that one got you? Two exciting strategies. So what we are doing here in our little mini sampling of life is we climb into the stuff until it's real for us. So we start to air it a little bit, open up the vents and the safety valves and get some of the gas out and get the whole thing flowing again. 
And then we start to change our consciousness direction. And we're starting in the other techniques too. Because if you're really good at the game, you can keep both techniques going all at once. You get closer to God, so baldness is less relevant. But you also don't make believe you're, you got hair when you don't. And you don't make believe it's beautiful if you still think it's not beautiful. And in, in response to many of you and many of me who feel that our hearts aren't open enough and that we can't afford to open our hearts because everything is going to die that we touch because anything we open our hearts to is going to die, going to end up in a corruption. The most profound answer to that is you can't afford not to. Just as simple as that. And the minute you appreciate the way in which suffering awakens, I guarded myself for a long time, and I could guard myself by being in this role. And then I couldn't afford it any longer. And I opened up and I fell in love, most romantic sense. Me, romantic, wow. And I couldn't have it the way I wanted it. And I suffered. And I cried and I raged and I was so miserable. And at the same moment, something in me was saying, you're alive, it's happening, good, sit with it. I tried to manipulate the universe to get it just the way I wanted it, and I couldn't do it. And I don't understate how it hurt. And when you don't get what you want, which is what happens when someone dies you love, when a lover leaves you, when something, when some model you've had doesn't, isn't functional, I don't say there will not be grief and there will not be mourning for your loss. And I warn you against prematurely pushing that underground. Allow plenty of time for grief. I tried very quickly to smile and say, oh, it's perfectly okay, it didn't hurt me, oh, I'm fine, because that's who I thought I was supposed to be but it did hurt and it kept hurting for a long time. And I had to give it plenty of space. And it's not too small. A lot of people come to me after six or eight months when they've lost a loved one and they say, I don't understand, I can't get my life going again. I said, you haven't even begun yet. Allow yourself at least two years to grieve. Go grieve some more. And then there comes a period where you've just gone through enough and the space starts to, that little blue sky starts to develop. And if you have a meditative awareness, with just that appreciation, you start to identify with the blue sky instead of the cloud. You flicker it first. And then you start to release. And often in the release, there is a closing of the heart because you don't want to get hurt again. And you've got to allow that. That's still part of the grief reaction. And a lot of you are still holding on to grief from previous hurts. And then comes the time when you start to realize you'd rather be vulnerable and be hurt than be living dead in the dead, dead sense, not in the living sense. And you can't afford it. And you start to open again. And the whole cycle starts again until finally you start to fall in love with love. You start to fall in love with truth. You start to fall in love with that of which form is but a reflection. You start to fall in love with God. You start to fall into love into yourself. And then there is no coming and there is no going. And then you are on the way to merging with your beloved. And that's, to me, what the game is about. And then dying and living are just dying and living. You know, it says before Satori, there are rivers and mountains. And in the Satori, there are no rivers and there are no mountains. And then after the Satori, there are rivers and mountains, something like that. Well, before Satori, there's dying. There's being born. In the Satori, you're in the formless, there's nothing. And then you finish the cycle, and there is dying, and there's being born. But it's all so different. It's just ah so. 
And there's finally a place where you can say I so with the simplicity of I so, without the psychological overlay of when I say I so, does it mean I'm too cold? Does it mean I don't have enough compassion? You can just say I so. Just another cloud, right? It's um, it's a beautiful metaphor. I really love it. Uh, the last uh, small excerpt that I want to present is a talk from a Choosing Love Over Fear. And, um, and uh, you know, fear represents separateness. Love, even romantic love, is the doorway into a deeper level. Uh, it may not be the unconditional love that Ram Dass, that we talk about all the time, which is more of the liquid merging but it's certainly love on its own in its own sense even that which is give and take uh is a doorway to uh to that deeper love uh and and the idea is when uh you know the idea is first is be here now being versus fear unity versus separateness when fear dissipates you are at home with the universe so you know the really um creating spaciousness around our identity with separateness uh it's it's not overriding your connection with everything so uh, the identity is is usurped by virtue of the of, of the spaciousness. Now, how do we get to that spaciousness? Uh, it's difficult because when you're a baby, you have a you know well developed sense of separateness, and um, and Ramdas's uh, antidote to this is awakening from the from the illusion. The doorway is through the heart. Because through the heart, love flows. Through the mind, mind creates boundaries. The heart is embracing and allows for the experience of grace and true being. When you're in the, in the presence of unconditional love, that's the optimum environment for your heart to open. Because within that environment, you feel safe. And, uh, and, and that's... Boy, that's the essence of, of, of what's in this in this film, especially you see the part around and how Ramdas talks about his meeting with Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba and just how um, God, how at home we all felt, how safe we felt. And we could open up in a way that we had never opened up before. And now uh, y- you can um, you can absolutely engage with that without going to India to meet such a being. It's not necessary. I mean, those of us that did go there needed to be hammered over the head, obviously. But we have seen hundreds, thousands of people over these decades that have had this experience of home, safety, and within that, then a creation of spaciousness can happen in our lives, and it has happened to so many people. And uh, so the definitive thread through this movie is the opening of that heart space and the turning from the continuation of somebodyness into nobodyness. And nobodyness, in our case, is not perhaps the... Uh, the enlightenment state of Neem Karoli Baba, but is the uh, the cultivation state that we are in, each of us, and cultivating that heart space allows us to start thinking about others rather than ourselves, number one, all the time. And uh, there's a one part in the movie where Ram Dass talks about when is what you, what I want enough? When is what I need enough? And you start to think about what can you do for anyone, from people close to you to people that 
you just happen to see just walking on the street. You naturally react. We have in us deep compassion, and we naturally react through that compassion to help somebody. And in that act, we stop thinking about ourselves, at least in those moments. And those are powerful moments. And they really teach us that that is possible to, uh, to certainly to cultivate and possible to live in that being rather than, so to live in connectiveness rather than separateness. And the other thing I'll say about the movie that I haven't mentioned, and I didn't pull any, uh, any of the talks that had to do with it, it's a, I'm going to leave it, it's the crescendo of the movie where Ramdas really addresses all of our fear, fears about death. And, uh, and he quotes, I'll just leave you with this quote from his uh, teacher, Emmanuel, who uh, he does a funny bit about because Emmanuel was, uh, did not have a body, and Ramdas got these teachings from him. And Emmanuel said, Ramdas, dying is absolutely safe. I love that. It's so great. Don't forget. Just go to becomingnobody.com and, uh, and you can find the theaters that this is going to play in starting on September 6, 2019. All right, so this is a, just um, choosing love over fear and I'm going to end with this. I think that the um, term love, uh, which has in it um, a two uses of the term, one is as the polarity between love and hate, and that has in it being loving as opposed to hating. It's a, and the other is the a quality or state of being which, in which the term love is used in the same way as presence or awareness is, that we enter into love, into the space of love. And I think that love lies behind fear i think that when you are experiencing fear you are caught in your separateness when you are experiencing love you are caught in your unity with all things that love is the verb love is a vehicle of permeating the boundaries and when you experience that opening of the boundaries you feel the quality of love which means a a flow or energy or merging with the universe around you and that one is obviously the antidote for fear. It's going to the place behind your own separateness. And the, the romantic quality of love, which is between separate entities, is, um, is a doorway into the deeper love. It itself is a lot of people experience a quality they call love, but they're doing it with their mind. They're not really opening their hearts fully. They are loving, meaning I am attracted to or I am attached to. But it isn't the quality of this kind of liquid merging. And I think the quality of love you are talking about, when Emmanuel talks about love versus fear, for example, we are talking about being versus fear. Or unity versus separateness would be the other way of saying it. So I would say that when the fear dissipates, you are feeling at home in the universe, meaning your identity with your separateness isn't so overriding your feeling of connection with everything that you're feeling cut off and vulnerable, which is where the root of the fear is. So as you cultivate that unitive quality then the fear dissipates so the relation is one between love and fear but it's not the love in the sense of i love you it's the sense of we are together in the space of love if you um keep seeing i'm just giving you this now a a, a way of seeing the sequence if you see the the new baby open, permeable boundaries, all completely wide open. And then you see the cultivation of its mind and models of itself and other, and development of a sense of separateness. 
And then you see the way in which we get trapped in that ego or sense of separateness and get trapped with identification with body and with personality, our phenomenal self. And then the interest, the question is, how do you awaken out of the illusion that you are only separate? And the doorway out of that is through the heart. Because the heart is, my heart goes out to you. The heart is, keeps, the heart is the doorway into the unitive nature of the universe. And it's the, the love, love flows. Love doesn't know boundaries. The mind creates boundaries. The mind creates the boundary of separate me and you. The heart just keeps embracing and opening out. So that things that open your heart open you out into the universe and allow you to experience the, the, the preciousness, the grace, the, the, the sweetness, the, the, the thick isness of it all, the, the interconnectedness of it all. It's even more than interconnected. It's all one thing and just keeps changing its flow and patterns and you're just part of it. And the opening of the heart is the doorway into that. So that when you love your pussycat, or you love your child, or you love your beloved, or you love nature, or you love something, that is a doorway. You start with that kind of love, which is relational, romantic love. And then that's a doorway that moves you into the kind of merging quality where we are together in love, which is in the, pre in the oneness of it all, in the existence of it all, which is God. That's the way in which you experience God. You experience, you are part of the, the divine manifestation into form, and you're one with it. So you start with this very relational love that is between you and something else, and it opens the heart, and then you, in a way, Go out through the heart and keep feeling a connection. As you know, when you're in love, how suddenly other things look beautiful, other than the beloved. It keeps going out and out and out and out. And that's a quality that... Um, so I would say that um, most of us stay locked in our separateness, and we are very frightened of coming out of it. We feel very vulnerable. In truth, you are not vulnerable at all. You just think you're vulnerable. Who you think you are is vulnerable. Who you are is not vulnerable. It's true. This is the truth of it. That's what Christ was saying over and over again, but nobody seemed to want to hear him. But you are not vulnerable, but you experience you are. And so it's very hard for you to open your heart to another being whose love is conditional. Because they're saying... I will love you as long as you're a certain way, and that pr you keep protecting yourself. So you find yourself very easy to open yourself sometimes to, an, to um, inanimate objects or to an animal or to a memory or to a, a very young child that's very innocent before it develops any kind of definition of itself that starts to manipulate the universe to get what it needs. Well, when you're with a guru, the guru is, realizes they're not vulnerable. They don't need you to do anything. They don't even need you to not shoot them, in the shooting example before. They just need you to be what you are. So their love is unconditional. And when you're in the presence of unconditional love, that's the optimum environment for your heart to open, because you feel safe, because you realize nobody wants anything from you. And the minute that heart opens, you're once again letting in the flow, and that flow is where you experience God. So that's it. That gives you an idea of what Becoming Nobody, the new Ramdas movie, is about. And, um, of course, it's the arc of, as I said before, the arc of his life and teachings, but it's also really how do we, how do, we do the conversion from a somebody to a nobody, and that nobody is about not being caught in our story so much that we can't even lift a finger to help another person. 
So that, that's what Becoming Nobody is. Go to becomingnobody.com and you can watch the trailer. You can see, oh, there's all kinds of goodies there, but basically just looking up where this theater might, uh, where this movie might play in a theater near you. There you go. This is Ramdas here and now on the Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and find the plethora of amazing podcasts. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.